So uh, it probably comes as no surprise to you that there are dozens of names for God that we find in the Bible. Dozens of different names, titles, similes, metaphors. And so this summer we're going to be looking at some of the names of God. It shouldn't surprise us because the fact of the matter is you and I also have an abundance of names and titles and nicknames that go along with us. I was born Stephen James Nelson. For the first couple of years of my life, I was Stevie. They did away with that one. I became Steve, and eventually I became Stephen, except to my grandfather, who called me Slats, which I never understood why that came along. Um, and then I got married, and I became Stephen James Heinzel Nelson. Um, and then uh, I became, started to accumulate some titles. I became Reverend Stephen James Heinzel Nelson, uh, affectionately known as Pastor Stephen. And most of you know me as Pastor Stephen. Uh, a few of you go back to the old Reverend uh, Stephen. That's okay if you want to do Reverend Pastor. It's the same thing. And then I went on and got another degree and I became Doctor, uh, Reverend Doctor Stephen James Heinzel Nelson. And when I pull that one out when I need to really like look. <laughs> the boom on somebody um, you know and those are just sort of like my professional uh, names and titles and things but then there's a whole bunch of nicknames back in high school it was bells I never understood it but all the kids called me that and I went to college I became Nelly um, and you know that one has stuck around for a little bit longer and then uh, now to my grandkids I'm pots um, all these different names, titles about the same person, and they all say something different about who I am, but it says also a lot about where they came from and the people who use that particular title at that particular time. And that's what we find in Scripture, is a host of different words, names, titles, images, metaphors that help us to understand God our God, the one true God. And so we're going to be looking at just some of the dozens and dozens of names that we find in Scripture throughout the summer. But we want to start at the very beginning, because it's a very good place to start. <laughs> Name that tune. Do re mi. Do re mi, sound of music, good job, extra points. <laughs> Um, start at the very beginning. Let's see where the Bible begins in talking about the name of God. Believe it or not, it's God. Lord, uh, as we come to the scripture this morning, teach us from your word. For your word is filled with truth, and that truth has the power to set us free. Amen. The name that we find at the very beginning is uh, Hebrew word Elohim. Listen as the Bible begins, Genesis 1, 1 through 5. When Elohim began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos. Darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from Elohim swept over the face of the waters. Then Elohim said, let there be light. And there was light. And Elohim saw the light was good, and Elohim separated the light from the darkness. Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. The first and one of the most important and one of the most common words that we find in the Bible for God is Elohim. It's a Hebrew word. It's an interesting word. Uh, it actually, literally translated, means gods. It is the plural of this singular uh, common word for God, which is just El. Elohim means gods. But it became known as a plurality of intensification. In other words, this Elohim, this gods, was intensive because they wanted to make it clear that this was the one God, the God above all the other gods, name became Elohim. 
This name is one of the most important names that we find in Scripture. Not only is it the first name, it is found in the Hebrew Scriptures 2,600 times. One of the most common words and names in all of Scripture. The only other name of God that rivals this one, in fact surpasses it, is a word that we'll be hearing later this summer, and that word is Yahweh. Yahweh crushes Elohim in terms of use. It is found a whopping 6,800 times, more than twice um, Elohim. And the two, even though they're two completely different words, Yahweh and Elohim, over time, they became conflated and so closely identified that the two now are almost inseparable. Now, when you read your Bible, if you come to the word Elohim, you will find the English translation as God, the one true God. But when you read your Bible, if you come to Yahweh, you will find the word Lord but written in four capital letters, L-O-R-D. When you see that written in your Bible, you know you have stumbled across Yahweh. Because these two different words were used, probably because of two uh, different backgrounds, um, it was a little bit confusing at times, because you're questioning, well, are you talking about two different deities, or is this the same deity, and um, how do we differentiate these uh, two things? Um, and eventually, as I said, the two ideas became conflated and brought together. But most scholars think that Elohim is a more primitive word that came to mean the one true God, above all gods. Yahweh was a word that was assigned later that began as a more um, tribal understanding of God, the name that was given to Moses at the burning bush, that eventually became seen as this one true God, and then the two names are brought together. And so often what you find in Scripture is the expression, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. For instance, in Deuteronomy 6, now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances, that the Lord Yahweh, see how they're capitalized? That's if you look in your Bible, you'll see L-O-R-D, they're all capitals. Your God, Elohim, charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you're about to cross into and occupy, so you and your children and your children's children may fear the Yahweh Elohim, all the days of your life. Keep all his decrees and commandments. I'm commanding you so your days may be long. Here, therefore, O Israel, observe them diligently, so it may go well for you, and you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey as the Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim of your ancestors have promised you. Here, O Israel, the yeah. is your Elohim. the Yahweh alone. You shall love the Yahweh with all your heart, all your soul, with all your might. Two different words, two different ways of thinking brought together. Again, generally, what people think of as the difference of intensification or focus is that Yahweh is uh, more this idea of the God who is with us, who walks with us, a God who is approachable, whereas Elohim is the God who is glorified, the God who is so big, so distant, so far, so great, so transcendent, so powerful, so all-encompassing, that this God deserves nothing but our greatest and awesome respect. Yahweh is Pastor Stephen. Elohim is Reverend Dr. Stephen James Heinzel Nelson. You get the difference. 
Friends, it is so important that we remember that this first name of God is a name that has to be internalized, that has to be embraced for us to be the people that God, this one true God, has created us to be. When our God becomes too familiar, when our faith becomes too casual, when our life becomes all about what's next and what's happening today, when our problems seem so great and so magnified, it may well be because our concept of who God is, our name of God, has become too small. There's a great book entitled just that, Your God is Too Small, written by a man named J.B. Phillips back in the 1950s, became a bestseller. It challenged people's concept of God that their name for God or the way they thought about God was a smaller God, the God of my political cause, the God of my need, the God of my uh, 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 cultural group, the God that is only there when I need God to be there, the God of materialism. All of these small gods, all of these things that become so important to us we elevate them to this status that is only to be occupied by the one true God, Elohim. When you and I lose a sense of the greatness of Elohim, the transcendence of Elohim, the power of Elohim, and the fact that this God has set up the world in a particular way, that this God has the power to manage the entire universe, that this God has created everything that there is, that this God is so beyond anything we can possibly imagine. When you and I lose that, our lives lose their shape. We lose our focus. We lose our direction. We forget who we are because we've forgotten who God really is. We've tried to bring God down to our size, to make God fit our lives rather than the other way around. When God is Elohim, when God sits on the throne, when we remember that our God is a creative, powerful God, then our lives find their proper place in that greater plan. You know, learning to live in harmony with the godly order of things is perhaps the most powerful discovery that we can make. Because the fact of the matter is, we don't like Elohim. Because Elohim has power over us. We want to be Elohim. We want to be in charge. We want to be in control. We want the universe to revolve around us. We want the world to work for us. We want everything to kind of go our way. At least I do. Learning to live in harmony with this greater story, this greater purpose, is so freeing to wake up one day and find out there is a God of the universe and it's not me. <laughs> is extraordinarily powerful. There is a God who can sort out the problems of our lives. There is a God who is able to take our greatest crushing disappointment and turn it into some awesome victory down the road. There is some God out there, this great God, this transcendent God, this Elohim God, who has set the world up in a particular way. And when you and I discover our role in that greater story, the meaning, the purpose, the power of God begins to flow into us and through us. It's called a calling. Research has shown conclusively that people who have a clear idea of who God is 
are healthier people. This is from a Stanford paper. Research has repeatedly shown that people of faith report feeling better and healthier. One of the most striking findings in social epidemiology is that religious involvement with God is better for your body in terms of immune function and reducing loneliness. Why? Because we need to have a transcendent God. Because we're creations of God. When we forget that we are created by a God of power, a God of infinite power and love. When we elevate ourselves to that place of importance that is due only to God, we become sick. We become lost. We lose our power. Some of you have been through the recovery community or part of that community. That group of people who have found themselves in the throes and the clutches of addiction. Maybe it's to a drug, to a chemical, to some habit or practice that we know is destroying us. And they find themselves with a group of other sufferers going through a spiritual process called the 12 Steps. Some of you perhaps are familiar with this. Maybe some of you are intimately familiar. And you'll know that the first step is the most important. It's to acknowledge that there is a higher power that can deliver us from our insanity. Now, in this program, they do not tell you who or what that higher power is. For some people, that higher power becomes some symbol or some other person or something else. But I'm here to tell you today, that higher power has a name, and that name is Elohim. That's the higher power. That's the highest power. That's the only great power worthy of our worship and our praise. When you and I bow down to some lesser God, some smaller thing, some lesser purpose in life, when we begin to worship at the altar of materialism and money and success and power and social media and technology or whatever else we have set up to have all of this power in our lives, friends, we become lost, weak, and defeated. And that's why we have to come back to the fact that there is one true God, Elohim, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Elohim, who has the power to restore. Elohim, who has set the world in motion. Elohim, who has brought together all of the molecules that make you who you are. And finding that way to live in step and in keeping with this great God, the one God, the one true God restores us to sanity and gives us back our lives. You know, coming to an understanding of this one true God gives us one of the most important qualities that is so missing in the time in which you and I find ourselves, and that is humility. Finding ourselves in the presence of Elohim, the one true God, immediately drives us to our knees. We become aware of our sinfulness, our brokenness. We become aware of how small we really are. How you and I are just a tiny, tiny speck in a much greater, greater story. And somehow, by remembering how small we are, it kind of makes us happier, healthier better. We become better neighbors, better friends, better listeners. Understanding that there is a great, great God 
this God who created the heavens and the earth, this God of power and might and all, reminds us that we simply owe this God, Elohim, our total allegiance, our love, and our lives. And friends, there is no better place to be in the presence of Elohim than on our knees. Oh God, forgive us for forgetting who you are, for putting these other tiny, insignificant gods at such an elevated position in our lives. Lord, we come back to you, you, the one true God, the maker of heaven and earth, the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the great God beyond us. We ask that you would just show us Show us who you are so that we can be reminded who we are. In Christ's name, amen.